welcome. <laughs> so uh, welcome everyone to the virtual Dickens universe and to the session uh, Foundations in Black Victorian Studies. Uh, my name is Ryan Fong and I'm one of the co-organizers of the virtual Dickens universe along with Trisha Lutens, Jason Rudy, and Bridget Fielder. I'm just gonna get started here with a few housekeeping things since this is our first live session. So first I wanted to alert you that this conversation is being recorded and we will be posting it so that others who couldn't make it for the live stream can come back and view it. Second, I want to offer a big thanks to everyone at the Dickens Project and to UC, at UC Santa Cruz, John Jordan, Renee Fox, and especially the incomparable Courtney Mahaney, uh, without whom none of this would be happening from the, the technical and logistical side. So thank you to them for all their support. And of course, as always, thank you to the friends of the Dickens Project for all their work in sustaining this organization over these 40 years. Third, since some of you might be joining us for the first time this week and might be new to the Dickens Project and the Dickens Universe, I wanted to just introduce it very quickly. The Dickens Project is an international research consortium based at UC Santa Cruz and devoted to the study of 19th century literature and culture. Every summer, it usually hosts the Dickens Universe on the Santa Cruz campus um, and would be happening this week. Uh, this, it was supposed to be happening this week this year. Um, bringing together university faculty members, graduate students, undergraduate students, high school teachers and their students, and <clears throat> lovers of Victorian literature um, and literature more generally from all over the world for an intense week of talks, seminars, Victorian teas, dancing, and various social gatherings. It's part academic conference, part book club, part summer camp for lovers of literature and especially Victorian literature and Dickens. Usually we focus on uh, one or two novels, most often, but not always by Charles Dickens. And it's become um, an important place where we can gather and spend time in community to study this particular period in history and, and these works of literature. We wish we could be gathering with all of you under the Redwoods this year, but we're very happy to have the virtual Dickens universe to bring us together um, to think about the program that we developed for this year, but have postponed for next year on David Copperfield and Iola Leroy. I hope that you will continue to follow along with all the conversations that are happening this week, each day. Um, and you will go back and listen to the one that was posted yesterday if you haven't already. I also hope that many of you will consider joining us in Santa Cruz next year. So finally, in terms of today's session, um, during the session, we'll be using the Q&A window as the platform to communicate with our presenters and with each other. Um, in this window, please feel free to enter questions that come up. We will be moderating those questions and asking them of our speakers uh, once their conversation has finished. If someone posts a question that you also want to see answer, we encourage you to, vote, to upvote um, it by clicking on the thumbs up icon. Um, we also encourage you, despite the name of the, the window, to, encourage, uh, to use the window as a space of interaction. So please use it to share information and links to resources with the other attendees. Um, our understanding is that the Q&A will be preserved after the session, and we're working out the tech logistics to save it and circulate it after the end of our conversation. Um, I also want to call your attention to the short statement of community guidelines around language, hate speech, and appropriate terminology. Uh, we, you can review it on the Virtual Universe website, and we will be posting it very shortly in the Q&A window. So please review it and, and follow those guidelines. Welcome again, and thank you for attending today. Um, I will now turn things over to my co-organizer, Tricia Lutens, who's gonna be introducing our panelists. Hi, everybody. One of the joys of this strange summer is having the chance to welcome and introduce two colleagues whose writing has changed my life, my reading life, my writing life, my teaching life. Um, Jennifer DeVere Brody is a professor of theater and performance studies and the director of the Center of Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity at Stanford University. Her books, Impossible Purities, Blackness, Femininity, and Victorian Culture, Duke 1998, and Punctuation, Art, Politics, and Play, also Duke 2008, focus on sexuality, gender, racialization, visual studies, and performance. An award-winning scholar of aesthetics, politics and subjectivity, feminist theory, queer studies, and contemporary cultural studies, Dr. Brody has contributed essays 
to theater journal, signs, genders, Callaloo, screen text and performance quarterly, and numerous edited volumes. She's also co-editor of GLQ. Her work's been recognized by the Ford and Mellon Foundations, the Manette Horowitz Trust for Independent Research Against Homophobia, and the Theater Society of Great Britain. Locally, she's contributed to Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project, Frameline Film Festival, the Transgender Law Center, and the San Francisco Gay and Lesbian Center. In 2018, she published, a, published an edited reprinting of James Baldwin's illustrated Little Man, Little Man, A Story of Childhood with Nicholas Boggs. She's currently writing a book about the intersections of sculpture and performance. Gretchen Holbrook Gretzina holds the Paul Murray Kendall Chair in Biography at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she's just finished a term as Dean of the Commonwealth Honors College. As a biographer, she writes, I'm interested in the lives and stories of people who cross lines of geography, race, or gender expectations. I write with a wide audience in mind, rather than just an academic one, and see myself as a chronicler of people, some of them forgotten today, whose lives have something to tell us about our own. The author of Carrington, A Life, 1989, Black London, Life Before Emancipation, 1995, Francis Hodgson Burnett, A Life, 2006, and Mr. and Mrs. Prince, How an 18th Century Family Moved Out of Slavery and Into Legend. She's edited three volumes by Francis Hodgson Burnett, as well as of course, the groundbreaking Black Victorians, Black Victoriana, 2003. Her latest edited volume, Britain's Black Past, is based on her 2016 10-part series for BBC Radio 4, and it appeared from Liverpool University Press just this year. Um, at the moment, besides expanding her research on the early African-American novelist Sarah E. Farrow of Chicago, whose writing she herself discovered, Dr. Gertzina is writing a book about Black and mixed race women in Britain before the 20th century, as well as a family memoir about growing up mixed race with family records dating back to early America. Both have generously read, reread Iola Leroy, have thought about Dickens, and are here to give us a conversation about the foundations of Black Victorian studies. Thanks. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Gretchen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tricia, for that lovely introduction for both of us. And, and I'll just say that um, I'm really grateful to be here and to John Jordan and Tricia Lutens, of course, Tricia, Ryan Fong, Jason Rudy, Kim, Tara, Courtney, everyone who's worked to bring this virtual conference to us today. Um, I think I was at the Dickens Project as a panel participant in the 1990s with my colleague in post-colonial studies, Sabina Sawney, talking about Thackeray. And I know that both Gretchen and I uh, have been haunted by the character of Rhoda Schwartz and, and, you know, thinking a lot about what does it mean to find the antecedents for some of those fictionalized characters, which has been so much of Gretchen's project, is one of the things I'm excited to talk to everyone today about. Um, I have a couple of other words of, of introduction um, and just to say I use she, her pronouns and that I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm talking to you from the unceded lands of the Mawekma Ohlone peoples, also the state of California, which like the rest of the country and the globe has seen uh, questions around enslavement, indentured servitude, and the ongoing too often violent struggles around the extension of human rights and democratic freedoms. Um, it's an especially difficult and auspicious time, perhaps the best and the worst of times, um, but I guess can't say how excited I am to have this dialogue with my respected colleague, Professor Gretchen Grazina, um, whom, for whom I wouldn't, my work wouldn't exist without hers. Um, so thank you to everyone. Good morning. So Jennifer, um, I was trying to think back to the first time I met you, and I think it was at Vassar when you came back, and I was teaching there, and it was the first time anybody said to me that my book Black London had been important to them, because you know you write these books and they go out 
there and you keep thinking about them and working on them and later you're just amazed to find out that people actually read them <laughs> and cared about it but i remember that day very very well and i've over the years we've met again of course but um i was really looking forward to having a chance to talk to you about the work that we started doing a long time ago and to find that the work that you've done is now still relevant, important, it's not over, um, that people still have a lot to think about and to say about it. And it's a conversation that taking place across the Atlantic as well. Um, so it's really wonderful to be able to, to talk to you about the work that you've done um, and to just talk about what it's like to be someone who does both Victorian and British studies, but also very involved in the discussions around race and around African American literature. And to think if there's some connection between the Victorian studies that we started off doing and also the, the African American um, things that we do. So um, I would just love to actually ask you <laughs> to start how you came into Victorian studies and then where you found this intersection um, with race as well in your own work. Thank you so much, Gretchen. And, and I want to just say as well that I was struck when Tricia was reading your biography of how much the word life um, yeah. <laughs> was repeated and your work um, to think about lives and the significance of that, of the lives we've lived. And I think that um, as a black woman who also happened to spend time in Britain from a child, uh, my parents were in London in the tumultuous year of 1969. Yeah. And, you know, I lived in Colhearn Court and in, in Southwest and went to school and walked in Kensington Park and was sort of literally encased in Victorian architecture and remember that sculpture of Albert, uh, you know, mm -hmm there uh, and uh, other things from that time and would go back repeatedly. So I think that that early connection to um, London had a, a formation for me that continued. And I remember reading Jane Eyre um, and asking for Mad Women in the Attic uh, as a high school student um, and reading all of Thomas Hardy. Uh, so there was something there in the literature that drew me, um, despite uh, what I might think of as Jose Munoz's ideas around disidentification, right? I was not necessarily hailed as the ideal reader, um, you know, uh, of those texts, but, but that was something that was curious to me that I wanted to know more about. And I actually went to Vassar uh, because it was the only school in the country that had an organized major in Victorian studies. I was the first graduate and it was thanks to the urban historian, Tony Wall, uh, that uh, allowed me to work on that. But I remember we had many classes on race and Victorian studies, post-coloniality. So uh, you, of course, taught at Vassar and know and were part of um, the rather progressive versions of Victorian studies, I think, that existed there. Um, and then in terms of African-American literature, that was what I always did at home. Uh, and uh, there was less African-American studies then at Vassar than there were courses in Victorian literature. Um, but of course, I was always reading. And my mother was chair of African-American studies at Wesleyan University. So uh, Hazel Carby and, you know, so many of the formative texts and that and this is also important to know. This was the late 80s, early 90s. I graduated from Vassar in 87 and immediately started graduate school at University of Pennsylvania and but was always doing African-American studies and Victorian studies. And that was, of course, um, an incommensurable connection until your work and then the work of Paul Gilroy when I finished my PhD in 1992, so that people um, understood that there was this transatlantic crossing. And what I love about your work is that you went and found the history that proved, right, what the segregated academy uh, disallowed in wanting to keep whiteness as the center or the putative objects and subjects of Victorian studies set apart, which is against the historical record. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that about the kind of separation of the two because 
um, I still find that people read one or the other and the fields don't cross in the ways that should because there's so much to, to say about the world they lived in and how those things weren't separated out. But there are many people now who know me as the person who writes about Black British studies. Um, and there are other people who know that I write about uh, white British people as well. And they don't realize the same person wrote those books. I mean, people are really often quite surprised as though you're supposed to stay in your lane and you're not supposed to cross over and, and do other things. And I still see that that occurs now. I, I recall that when um, Henry Louis Gates was writing about Hannah Croft, the, the, the discovery of that book, uh, The Bondswoman, and he was trying to uh, kind of explicate a particular urban scene in the novel. And then it wasn't until Hollis Robbins said, you know, that's a scene straight out of Bleak House. She was clearly reading Dickens. Um, and he didn't know, he didn't recognize that. And I thought, ah, he hasn't really taken on board the fact that Victorian studies and African-American literature had great crossovers. And that's why it's so important that we think about the fact that Dickens may not have been reading um, African-American writers because at that time, you know, what do we have? We have some slave narratives and things. Um, Iola Leroy comes up later, but, um, but certainly the women were reading, the African-American women and men who were starting to write, they were reading him and they were reading Thackeray and they were, very well versed in the literature, the Victorian literature that was crossing the Atlantic with before the age of copyright and all of that, they were very well versed in what was happening in that literature. It's only fair now that we start putting everyone back into the same picture. So what made you want to, to write your first book? What drew you to that? Um. Well, I was just thinking before I answer that question that I wanted to add on and absolutely agree with what you've just said. Um, and although I didn't choose in my first book, Impossible Purities, to talk about uh, sort of the readers and the actual African-American women and men who existed in the time, um, I do want to say first that Dickens, of course, gives us one of the first descriptions of uh, Henry Juba, right, and of dancing, uh, which is a kind of form of break dancing that can go all the way up to Fred Moten and work on in the break. That that account that he gives when he came to America was really important. And again, although I wasn't chronicling this, um, you know, Ida B. Wells, uh, Linda Brent, Harriet Jacobs, all go to England. Frederick Douglass, yeah. right, and we now begin to Sarah Parker Ramond. We begin to see so many other scholars follow that work that you've done on um, looking at the actual uh, transatlantic crossings, which I'm going to be doing for my next book on Edmonia Lewis, an Afro-Native 19th century sculptor whom ha Harper actually knew. Um, so I was looking more at the sort of theoretical issues um, around how whiteness came to be uh, the putative subject, as I said earlier, of Victorian studies and looking at a particular brand of whiteness that was in formation uh, throughout the 19th century. And I went to um, London and I got to work in the British library, the old one under the Blue Dome, the same mm -hmm. one that Mark sat at. And I'm, I thought I'd never be grateful for uh, censorship, but because plays were censored at the time, the Lord Chamberlain collected play scripts for every play produced and some not produced. But I found there after England had gotten rid of slavery in the 1830s, um, a whole series of plays about black American enslaved women who were rescued by British gentlemen, uh, sort of the plot of Boussicot's uh, Octoroon in the 1850s, um, but much earlier, so that they had these rescue narratives because the ideas around miscegenation were so different. Uh, we didn't have anti-miscegenation laws. Uh, it was 
in, in England as we did in the US uh, uh, or what would become the US. So I was really fascinated um, by these different and international conceptions of how whiteness, right, um, became important. And of course I was influenced by uh, a number of black feminist theorists. That's another innovation in the book, I think, um, that I used Hazel Carby, Kimberly Crenshaw, Val Smith, uh, you know, so many, um, Patricia Ward Williams, black feminist theorists to read white men. And I thought, again, all of these sort of subtle power plays around epistemology, um, how do we, whom do we look to as authorities? I was using their theoretical interventions to try to think about these Victorian texts. Um, and one of the, the other major texts that was influential was one I know you worked on and I'd like to hear you speak about, which is Toni Morrison's Playing in the Dark, um, her series of lectures about whiteness and the literary imagination. Um, and that book really changed my orientation to my work. Yeah, it, it did mine as well. Um, I was lucky enough to know Tony, and um, I still think hard about her, like daily. <laughs> um, I spent over a year working daily with her. Um, so we had met in the past, and then one day she called me up. I was actually living in London at the time, doing some teaching, and my children were in school in London at the time, too. So. Um, and she called me up and she said, I'm going to go to Princeton. I've got a new job and I want to teach this new course that I'm inventing called American Africanism. And I want you to come to Princeton for a year and work with me and um, help teach this course. You can be a preceptor and, um, and all of that. So I, I did, because um, you don't like say no. Um, and <laughs> and uh, people later said, oh, did you have to go to Toni Morrison in order to learn about African-American literature? And I said, well, actually, no. But if that's the way you're going to learn it, that's an awfully good person to be learning it from. Um, so she, she was putting together those, those lectures and articles, and she would run them by me as well and say, here's what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about Poe right now, and here's how he uses the word knows, you know, and all of those things, the, the N-O-S-E and I knows. Um, and she would give the lectures, and then I would meet with the students, and I gave some occasional lectures. And then we pretty much had dinner a couple of times a week with Cornell West, and uh, Mike Eric, Michael Eric Dyson was a, was a graduate student there, um, and I got to know quite a number of really important people in it. It truly did change my life. But the thing that she gave me to think about with all of that was, if she can do this with American literature, how do I transfer that to what I'm thinking about with British literature? And I actually wrote an entire manuscript called Racial Fictions, which I never published, which was really looking at largely forgotten novels that had African-American or Caribbean or African characters in them written by British authors. And I was trying to, to see what I had learned from her take on American um, canonical literature that I could transfer into thinking about British literature. Because the fact is that I think when I was younger, I read some of those books and those, those things with, with um, embarrassment. And I wasn't quite sure how you, what to think about that. I, I know that um, when I did that BBC radio series, the first thing they, they had me talk about was why, why me to do this work on Britain's Black Past. And I said that there was a strange feeling about being an American and reading all of these books and thinking, did they imagine me to be their audience? Did they think that in any world that I could be someone they were writing to or from or against? And how do I fit into this as somebody who's not British, um, who's mixed race, who is utterly, utterly fascinated by these books? I did my, my undergraduate degree, my thesis on Dickens. Um, I'd write a very different thesis on Dickens now 
But at the time when I was 20 and 21, I thought, well, I'm going to think about Dickens and crime or social change or women and prostitution and all those things that people were thinking about at the time. But now I can have that perspective to think about, you know what? Dickens probably saw black people on the street. He, he probably um, was, he might, might not have been involved, but he certainly saw slavery firsthand when he came to America and he traveled and gave his talks. And there might well have been some knowledge that there was an African-American audience for his work as well. So I, I think I, I, I never intended to write Black London. You know, I had written my first book on Dora Carrington and the Bloomsbury Group. And I had been reading about Black British um, studies as much as I could find at the time. There were some wonderful people whose shoulders I stood on. Um, but I remember I, I started the book by saying I walked into a bookstore that I didn't name at the time. It was either Dylan's or Foyle's. And the, uh, the Pl Pluto Press edition of, of suddenly forgot the name. Um, the, it, anyway, this book had just come out and I'll tell you in a second because it's really important, famous book. And it's enormous. And I walked around trying to find this book. I looked in sociology, I looked in literature analysis, I looked in history. And I finally went up to a saleswoman and said, you know, I am looking for this book. And she said, she looked really puzzled, and I knew it had just come out because it had been written up in the newspapers. And she said, Madam, there were no black people in England before 1948, until after the Second wind World rush. War. But yeah, after the wind rush. And I said, oh, but yes, there were. And she said, oh, no. And she said, well, not in any numbers that are noticeable. And I, so I just put everything down, my racial fictions book, everything just got shoved in a drawer. And I wrote this, this different book because I just wanted people, and that means British as well as American, to know that this did not, these books were not written in a vacuum. So you wrote a very different book for your second one, but I, I'd like to hear more about what you're working on now and, and some other of your work and maybe say a bit about how you joined together African American, theater, Victorian, all of those things come together in your work. Um, did you ever find any sense that you were an outlier trying to bring some new knowledge to something that people really didn't know? Well, that's why I was so grateful for your example and Paul Gilroy and Stuart Paul and, um, you know, just even a way to say, no, this is part, as you were saying, a larger conversation um, yeah. that you discover because you know, uh, I think that imagination, what you can imagine your own life and looking back, that there is got to be a connection and sometimes things find you uh, as well and um, I know it, it's so exciting to have now a much broader conversation that was really just happening then around Black British studies. I remember uh, my third year of graduate school I was studying in the summer at Oxford um, doing African American study um, and African studies as well, and it was with Val Smith and mm. Elizabeth and Boy Boy and some other folks. But we had a special session where Isaac Julian came in and showed an early uh, clip of his film, which would become Looking for Langston. And, um, you know, that idea, right, of how do you go back and imagine a past that you know existed. Um, but, you know, finding the evidence for that uh, and that excitement around that. Um, so I think I just always knew, I knew Black folks in Britain um, that, uh, you know, and I was interested in questions of race and racism and the origins of racism, the scientific, uh, now debunked, you know, erroneous tracks around that, thinking through, um, yeah, questions of, of difference. And I guess, you know, that sort of even autobiographical influence or question around criticism was one of the driving factors. Um, I also, um, in terms of my second book, which was all 20th century, I mean, it's like you're writing about Bloomsbury, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's the question too, I think of methodology right uh and and what you expect to find where what you think you're looking for are blind spots um that we all have uh but 
I was very interested, uh, even in the second book, I quote Ignatius Sancho, whom I learned about from you, <laughs> the 18th century composer, yeah. because I was writing a book about punctuation and his letters are filled with uh, fabulous, uh, exuberant punctuation. Um, so, you know, there was always a seed, uh, I think, where I'm always returning to these questions of Black British cultural studies and Black people in Britain um, who are cultural producers learning from uh, the U.S. and vice versa through this transatlantic traffic. I would say as well that for the new book on Edmonia Lewis, had it not been uh, for the amazing work of Marilyn Richardson, who's writing a biography of Lewis. I didn't even know that Edmonia Lewis, who was Afro-native Chippewa from the U.S., but found refuge after she had been beaten in Oberlin and had a famous trial uh, with the head of Howard Law School, John Mercer Lincoln. This is totally in the 19th century. This is the 1860s. Yeah. She decamps to Rome uh, in, to become a, a neoclassical sculptor. Um, and she knew Frederick Douglass and uh, spoke multiple languages. And, you know, he had said actually on a trip with her that her Italian and her native Chippewa um, uh, uh, language, Ojibwe language, was such that uh, she barely spoke English anymore. But it turned out she did go to London and that's where she passed away in 1911. Um, and, uh, you know, so this idea of a circulation, we find it hard to believe now, and I think we're all dreaming of travel perhaps at this moment. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was always much more connection, contact, continuity, as you were saying. Black women were reading, uh, you know, Dickens, the, you know, Uncle Tom's Cabin was a bestseller on both sides of the Atlantic by all English leadership, translated into multiple languages. So it really is a global world. Um, but there's a way in which, um, as I believe, the historical connections get lost in the paucity of what we sometimes perceive as the limits of our own disciplinary formations. So that brings up a question of imagination, because in some ways, we want people to imagine themselves back into this time. And we look at authors who sometimes said some really disparaging and awful things. They, they were um, anti-slavery. They were mainly abolitionists, but not all British were. As we know, the British originally um, were very supportive of the South in the Civil War. And they were against slavery as things turned. They now take credit for ending slavery as though there were no people who were self-involved in trying to work on this themselves. Um, but there is a sort of loss of that history to people, and not just the history, but the importance of the literary imagination. And that's what I really noticed when I, when I found that Sarah E. Farrow novel, because there was no sense, and I found nothing to suggest, that she was really aware of African American writers at the time. She moved north, um, her family moved to Chicago before there was a big, before certainly the Great Migration, before any of those things. She wrote her novel in the 1890s when she was interviewed about her favorite writers. She said, Trollope, Dickens, Thackeray, um, the greatest hits, you know, of Victorian novels. And she set her book in an England that she had to imagine Mm -hmm. And she imagined it from the literature that was suggested to her by these books, but, but which was um, clearly um, overlaid onto what she knew about urban life in America or what she thought she knew about British life. So the imagination had to go both ways. And it was exciting to me to think she had to imagine her, her, way into this other world. And the way to do that was to erase her blackness in order to erase, immerse herself into this. I have no sense that her publisher knew that she was black. She was not um, in, she, her book was True Love, was in the women's pavilion, in the World Expo Exposition it, in Chicago. It was not in the African-American pavilion. She was not recognized as a writer. And the only way that we know and that I was able to find her was that I saw a small piece in the, and I think, I don't know, the Morning Post, you know, some British newspaper saying that 
it was the first novel written by a colored woman um, in America. Now it wasn't the first book, but she, it, that got picked up. So it got repeated in other newspapers and I had to go looking for her. And the only other mentions I found were in um, African American newspapers of the 19th century. They were able to, to find that. And she talked very openly about, you know, the, what she read and how important it was to her. But somehow there was still that, that separation between her life and the life that she was imagining. In the same way that I see um, Thackeray, who certainly saw black people, um, we know that he didn't think very well of them and that he had this horrible um, caricature of Rhoda Schwartz. Um, but at the same time that he did see back black people and they did not look anything like her or behave in any way like her. And so I worry about the imagination superseding what's in front of you. Um, and I think in some ways, um, you know, that worked both ways, but, oh, the book was Staying Power by Peter Fryer. Um, yeah, I'm just going kind to of think of the Bible, that. the Bible right. of, of right. Black British history. James Walvin and Shot. yeah. Yeah, they were Shyland. They were wonderful people, did important, important work. So now, um, how do you read these novels now? Other than the way, I know that when you worked with Tony Wall, who, who I think his big project was on Punch. Um, yes. And he, so the way, do you read these books differently today than you read them as an undergraduate or, or as a graduate student? Well, I think that was something that came up yesterday in the panel and Ryan was talking about, you know, it's the question of how we bring these together. Uh, and I think there's not one way to do it. Um, and I'm really excited that Caritha Mitchell and Carla Peterson are gonna talk about, you know, the amazing work they've done in early African-American literature and especially Caritha's really authoritative um, introduction for Iola Re Leroy, which gives us multiple ways of understanding the significance of these texts. And uh, I'm somewhat uh, ecumenical and, and agnostic about how to do it, um, but I think that we should all be trying to think about how to repair the connections um, that have been, I think, lost uh, and miss, miss over in a sense. And I want to quote um, Ranjani Chatterjee, Alicia Christoph, Alicia Christoph, and Amy Wong, whose Undisciplining Victorian Studies came out recently in the LA Review of Books, really just July 10th. Mm -hmm. And I know they're working on a bigger introduction, but they said that we don't have to turn away from the mainstays of Victorian literature to study empire and racialization, although it may be useful to set these works in new constellations. And I think that just before we actually came on for today's seminar, uh, all of us were talking about um, reading and rereading and how our uh, sense of the times, our um, set of critical um, capabilities does change. And so I don't read these texts the same way at all. And, and you know, I used to teach Iola Leroy as part of my introduction to African American literature classes from Lucy Terry, whom I know you're related to and have done amazing work well, on. I'm not related to her, but. Oh, but okay, <laughs> but I'm sorry. Um, but I know you know about, uh, and, yeah. and, you know, starting there um, through, and, and, you know, the dialect sections, um, you know, all the things, I think even our ability to read a three-decker novel or something like Copperfield, you know, um, uh, reading practices change um, and and our sense of these books even as classics change and, and I think one of the things that's been interesting to see is how they were like you know uh, confederate monuments right yeah. some of Dickens I used to say teaching that was popular fiction it was not you know taught at Oxford Oxbridge you know, and so to teach it in a university classroom where it's repackaged by Penguin and labeled as a classic, you know, I mean, again, some of the work even of the Dickens Project um, is a, a reproduction, a repackaging that may or may not write actually, um, uh, that, that spoke to the, the desires of the time. And I think even the entire project right now of looking at or trying to read African, what 
would sometimes be called African American literature, or Iola Leroy and David Copperfield. This is part of this, um, you know, new constellation of trying to rethink relationships. One of the things that struck me as you were saying that was that I used to go teach, take classes and do special collections. Um, and they would bring out things like you did it too. And they would, they would bring out the serialized versions of all of these books. And so that you would see oh, the Dickens novel, you know, and it's monthly serialization with no academic introduction, no edited by, no glossary, no footnotes. And you realize that you are reading what they would have read at that time. And it, it did fascinate me that Harper also serialized her original work. They were part of a very different kind of publishing and readership um, genre at the time. Iola, of course, is the first one that she published as a single book and not just serialized. I think that's correct. That's correct. But, but Dick, Dickens was always writing for the next month you know, what the next thing was going to happen. And I think that's what she did as well. And there were a lot of African-American writers who were writing for magazines or for installments in the same way. So to bring them together in a way is a, a very different kind of readership now because we think, oh, I look at David Copperfield and I say, that is one thick book. <laughs> um, can I get through it all? Whereas um, a great experiment is to actually read each just read one section every month in the way that people would have read it over 18 months or something and and to see her work as well. One of the things that struck me as I, I used to live and teach in England several times was that um, the British tend to put African American literature under the heading of post-colonial. I see that a lot and they call it post-colonial studies and I wondered if you'd encountered that and what your take on that is. Well, I think there's a, a sort of parallel track and it's no accident that some of the uh, younger scholars that I'm so excited about, there's a group in Germany, um, Felipe Garrido, Marlena Tronike, and Julian Wack, who are working on a book called Toward Black Neo-Victoriana, which includes also uh, sort of Cora Kaplan's idea of Victoriana is expanded, including recent um, film and TV work like the Penny Dreadfuls and, you know, really, really beyond the time, um, but, uh, you know, in terms of post-colonial studies, uh, and this is a much broader discussion, having worked with CVAC a little bit, you know, thinking about what is the post-colony and what are the proper terms, is it neo, um, you know, are we still in an era of colonialism in many ways, um, or bringing in settler colonialism? Um, those are somewhat theoretical questions, but I do think it has something to do with the fact that um, for England, especially in the 19th century, for Britain, uh, which you know, really started at the beginning of the 18th century as a unified group, um, uh, you know, there was a much expanded version of blackness. Um, you know, seeing so many people and the connection, of course, with slavery in the West Indies and, you know, African, uh, you know, people studying and coming and all of the various kinds of blacks that were extant uh, there. So I think it makes more sense to sort of see it as part of um, both, uh, you know, that larger sense of, of imperialism of the colony um, that we don't necessarily have in the, in the U.S., I think in the same way. Yeah. You know, I was thinking also about how we have to read differently now. And I was thinking way back in graduate school when we read um, T.S. Eliot's um, um, The Individual, it was it the, something in The Individual Talent? And it was about how you have a canon and it's sitting on a shelf and then somebody writes something new and the shelf, all the books have to shuffle around to make room for that new book. Um, but that book changes how all the others are now read and received. And it's almost impossible for me to read books um, by Victorian authors without thinking, oh, this is how I have to think about it now. This is the way I, these books have to have some context. But yet I have to say that it doesn't necessarily spoil my pleasure in reading those authors. I haven't canceled um, Trollope you know, or Thackeray, I have some problems with, but that's okay. Um, 
but I, I notice things in a, in a different way. But I, when I, if I want to sit down and read a novel just for pure pleasure, I'm as likely to pick up one of the Palliser series and, and read that as I am to read um, something that is more modern. Um, and you can go back and forth and, and they can share the bookshelves um, and they can share our, our kind of headspace. But I do notice things more. I noticed in David Copperfield early in, there was a reference to him um, saying that he had gotten, I guess, I can't remember, soiled and dirty in some way on the street and that he looked like a mulatto. And I went, oh, huh, how did I forget that? And it's just a passing thing, but it's a reference that everyone would have caught at the time and not thought too much about. Um, yeah. I want to continue with this theme a little bit on the materiality of the book. Yeah. Um, because, of course, these were also often illustrated, yes. right? Um, yes. And um, thinking about Thackeray as well. Um, and I, I just wanted to maybe hear you talk a little bit about the idea, which Toni Morrison also mentions in Playing in the Dark, which is that even if these books don't include Black characters, they were part of um, a commerce and uh, profiting off of certain kinds of actual uh, transactions. Um, yeah. and, and illustrated. So do you, I mean, I know you do a lot of archival work, uh, yeah. reading letters and all that. I mean, do you have things to say about what it means to actually um, engage materially with a lot of this material? Yeah, I know. You know, I, I, someone was com contacted me the other day and said, oh, he had done his research before there were things like, you know, databases that he could start looking at for things. Um, and I said, when I first started, I had to go to a local shop to get a fax sent to me from London in order to work on my work. But you mentioned working in the old British Library, which was a wonderful place to work, although I could never find anything. I don't know about you, but- They took um, a long time to bring the books to you. And, yes, it did. And also sort of asking too about what you were mentioning earlier of going to the bookstore and like the categories and where you even oh. look to find things and what gets lost in the cracks and what it means to go and actually put it together. Yes, and I, and I think there was something very tactile and very moving and very wonderful about working in the archives. Um, I, would, I would sit there and sometimes um, I can remember sitting there weeping of, over telegrams that I was reading because Carrington was, um, was about to commit suicide or Lytton Strachey had, had, was going to die and she was being hopeful and said, oh, he's got rallying today. I'm saying, no, no, he's not gonna rally. And, you, and then I, but then when you find these things um, that were the actual artifacts of people, it, it makes everything come alive because you are actually, in some cases, touching the things they touched. When I worked, when I taught in the special collections, I can remember that the, the librarian brought out to my class a, 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 one of the first editions of Phyllis Wheatley's poems. And I said, oh, how wonderful. And the class ooh and nod. And he opened it up and she had signed it. And I thought, Phyllis Wheatley helped this book that I'm holding now. And how important is that to know that that materiality makes her poems even more real. We can read anything online, but if we have the actual letters, the actual people, the actual things that we don't use, but that we read about, it's the same way that you found those plays that maybe weren't produced. You think, okay, what is the context within which this play was written? And here is this thing I can look at. I think it's something we've, we've lost. And um, I, I feel very bad about that in some ways, because even I don't, go, well, right now you can't. But the idea that a perfect day to me was to go sit in a library and have something brought out to me that might change the way I thought about everything. And it wasn't just something I found on the computer. It was a cart that rolled out with some things that made a difference to the people who produced them at, at the time and who read them and received them. It was quite wonderful. And then when you're working on your book now, it's going to be in the same way, I assume, because you're going to have to travel. Well, actually, the letter that I cited about Frederick Douglass, I did find online, and Duke uh, has published some 
letters written by enslaved people and put them online and you can do obverse and reverse. So it's not entirely it's wonderful, lost, but it's, no, uh, no, you know, it's and it's more accessible, <laughs> I suppose, in that way. Um, yeah. Just, just interesting. I think maybe it's a larger issue too about what is, is accessible because we have Google books or we have other things, but um, you know, I think we have more access now to medieval literature than yeah. we do to some of the African American literature that everybody should be reading or books by black authors or however we want to think about that. Yeah. So I, I think we're almost out of time. I'm not sure, but you know, I, I, I wanted to not disparage the, the technology because it has changed the way we do everything. And it's I mean, allowed we, us to talk and for me to see you, which I That's have. right. <laughs> we wouldn't be here today without the technology, but I have been able to find things that are in archives and databases that are now digitized that were impossible before. I never would have found Sarah E. Farrow if I hadn't been on some digitized archive where I found this tiny little ad and was able to, to trace it back. So I don't want to discourage our, our listeners, our viewers here, um, because it has really changed. A book can probably get written in half the time that it used to, um, simply because you have access to the material. Um, but I will finish reading Iola again. Um, and I don't know if I um, would want to imagine the conversation that she might be having with Charles Dickens. But I notice on the poster that the two of them are there as though they the authors were in conversation, and I'm not sure I could imagine that conversation. Might be a good project for someone to do a play. Yes. <laughs> so I think we probably should go to the Q&A now. Yes, so I'm coming back on. So um, thank you for such a rich and wonderful <laughs> conversation. And I, um, I lost complete track of time and I could have listened to you talk for much longer. So, um, um, but I've been keeping track of, of some of the questions. And um, because you, were, you kind of ended on an archival question, um, I want to uh, just kind of lift up a question from Justin Thompson, um, who is saying you both made some wonderful discoveries in the archive. And I'm wondering if you might describe your strategy when approaching an archive. How did you balance looking for something specific while also allowing for the possibility of finding something unexpected? Well, I don't know what to say with that one. Somebody asked me once, um, how, do I, how do I go about finding an undiscovered work like you did? And I said, <laughs> you don't go about it. If it's serendipity, something falls out at you or something happens. I think it depends on what you're working on, what you're looking for. Um, when I did the book on Mr. and Mrs. Prince, which I did actually with my husband, um, who, who's not an academic, I discovered that my view of the archival research was very different from his. Mine was very methodical, um, and his was more intuitive, and he actually found more things than I did. So I, I generally would go into an archive hoping you know, thinking I'm going to be looking for this person or these kinds of materials or these kinds of letters. But then, you know, you do end up down a rabbit hole. And sometimes that's very productive and it takes you where you weren't expecting to go. And, and I think that's one of the joys of it. And I think Jennifer might say something similar. Oh, absolutely. In fact, this project that I've been obsessed with, with Monia Lewis, who was, you know, this queer Afro-native subject of Aunt Le Lettre, I was in the St. James Reading Library working on Charles Reed, and he had these notebooks, 60 notebooks, and I couldn't go through all of them where he'd done clippings of, you know, cross-dressing women and all these strange things. That's not so strange, but I mean, that he was interested <laughs> in to him. And one of them, I just surreptitiously, this is the way before iPhones. This was in maybe 93. Uh, and I opened one and I snapped a picture that had sort of the word Negro heads and pictures. Lo and behold, literally 15 years later, that little photograph, I had taken a picture of Edmonia Lewis and some of her sculptures <laughs> that he had cut out from the London Illustrated News. But I didn't recognize her as such, I didn't know who she was until after I had started the project because I was interested in Afro-Native women. And I cannot tell you the tingles that went yeah. through, you know, so I, was, I had absolutely no idea, but she had found me, I think. I mean, maybe that's a little too 
something. But, uh, you know, this happens in the archive. You really don't know. And then, of course, there's a whole question of what's not in the archive. What is an archive? What's preserved? Under whose name? You know, uh, it, that, too, is an in, um, accurate record um, that is full of holes. And so I think there's a lot of serendipity involved. Um, but, but there is something about uh, artifacts yeah. that can draw one in. Both of us had um, found hair, people's hair in our kind of research or family records and things. And talk about having some corporeality. Suddenly when you, you have someone's hair in your hands, you really realize that came from an actual body, a real person. But I think that's exciting, that photograph you took. That's, that's an amazing moment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's, there's a, a, a pair of questions that I kind of want to put together because I think they might get at similar issues. So Paula Krebs um, asked, how much do you think a focus on empire has prevented a full consideration uh, of transatlantic um, discussions around race and how can they better exist in Victorian studies? And I saw this, at least in my head, uh, as, as kind of chiming with Rachel Tukolsky's um, uh, question, wonderful conversation. In imagining global 19th century blackness, how does transatlantic African American British studies relate to African studies or Caribbean studies or others? Um, are there also misconnections across these geographic fields? And so it's kind of a field question, but also categories that, that kind of emerge and create discussions, but also maybe dis disrupt or sideline discussions. Um, so I don't know, if, however you want to uh, maybe tackle either of those questions. You know, I think empire has become a kind of convenient pot to put pe things into. And, um, you know, when I'm in England and they talk about empire, they're more often talking about India um, than they are the Caribbean. Um, although they all get mixed together into the same kind of conversation, there are historians of empire who, who talk about this. And I think what they really look at are the mechanisms of empire. How did it work? How did it really happen? Rather than um, what I see is the kind of endless give and take flow of people and ideas around the globe that, that crossed in ways that we didn't necessarily anticipate. So you can't put India into one box and, and Jamaica into another box and say, well, you know, it's all empire. It was all colonialism. But um, it, so I find it very hard because, you know, really Britain is very tiny. <laughs> it's very small. The world is very big. And yet they brought the world to their door. So how do we think about empire in that way? Jennifer, I don't know if you have a different thought on that. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, these are um, useful categories for particular kinds of projects. But any of them doesn't really tell the whole story. I just had a, a student working on uh, minstrelsy that included yeah. South Africa and, you know, like Mahe, other islands, um, yeah. you know, looked and looped in India. Um, again, I think there's always a global flow of traffic, as, as I agree with Gretchen, and it's convenient sometimes to talk about different forms of governmentality. I mean, actually, not just convenient. I mean, that is important. Uh, and to look at comparisons. But again, I think that those are uh, scholarly sometimes categories or practices uh, of the time that tell one part, but, but you know, are not necessarily uh, able to capture all of the connections. Great. Um, so there's a, a couple questions here too that I'm, I'm going to put together. Um, so these are uh, asked by graduate students. Um, and so kind of thinking about their relation to, um, to this work, especially around Victorian studies and race and, and non-white authors. Um, and so Danielle Dye, I'm, and I'm sorry, Danielle, I'm going to kind of condense your question, but um, kind of advice for graduate students of 19th century literature working on issues of race, how to do that work. Um, as a responsible ally um, and in an anti-racist way, not just silencing or taking over black voices and lives. Um, and then putting that kind of in conversation with um, Jacqueline Barrios's question um, that's specifically asking about disidentification, but um, expectations in, of readers and scholars of color 
within Victorian studies, kind of what it means for graduate students kind of coming at this from, from different positions um, and thinking about, about that relationship to the texts and, and to themselves and their work. I'm gonna let Jennifer take that. I've been a dean for so long, I haven't really been immersed in some of those issues, although I'm going back into the faculty. <laughs> well, you know, I, I spend a lot of time um, and have since 19, let me think, when did, well, Walden died in 87, as we taught a course solely on him. In fact, we had to fight to uh, teach a class solely on Baldwin because before it was only Chaucer, Milton, Dickens, and Shakespeare. Right. Right. That was single author courses. No, really, we had to petition mm to have Baldwin be a single author course. So I've been teaching that for many years. Um, and, you know, he always was very smart about talking about identification. You know, for example, he thought that he was rather similar um, to a 1940s actress who had kind of bug eyes like he did, right? <laughs> um, and he also, you know, read a lot of Dickens, Baldwin. Um, and so I think that these ideas of um, who we are, when we read and how we read, um, I do believe it's more of a give, a give and take. And I think that the question even of allyship, and, and maybe I'm going to put myself out here around this, um, you know, these are books that everyone can and should read and critique uh, in the ways I think Gretchen has done so well, you know, that you want to try to reshape how Rhoda Schwartz, uh, you know, was a very bastardized version, if you will, uh, a caricature of actual people with whom, you know, Thackeray may have come in contact with. Um, we're trying to think through, um, you know, again, who has authority and you must give yourself the authority to read um, according to your critical standards. So uh, I, I don't subscribe necessarily to this idea of, of who can who can speak and to what and how, right? You, I think that's important to put the politics on the table, right? But it shouldn't preclude you yeah. from reading whatever you want to, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so um, the, we just have time for a couple more questions. So the, the top question in terms of upvoting uh, has been, <laughs> been Ray Griner's question um, and um, she says that uh, I'm so grateful for the point that while the 19th century in Britain has often been associated with the invention, invention of modern race, the invention of whiteness as opposed to other racial categories has been sidelined, made less visible. I wonder if you have thoughts about how to think about in particular um, the numerous ambiguously raced characters that appear in Victorian literature, um, not as passing characters. And, and um, Bridget Fielder had an had a interesting response about passing and not passing characters in, in the African-American literary tradition. Um, but how what might we think about Heathcliff, Taddy Corum, uh, et cetera, and what we might say about, about those, those ambiguously raised characters in, in, in Victorian literature and what it means to read them as such? Yeah, it's really an interesting question because a lot of authors use these ambiguous characters to, to just be, to, to show there's some confusion. There's some, what's behind that? You know, do, is it because um, they carry something impure, as, as Jennifer would have said, um, and therefore are suspect in some ways? Or um, is it quite deliberate? Heathcliff, I think, is quite deliberate. And um, Carol Phillips' novel, The Lost Child, mm -hmm. really brings that to the fore and, and it makes it a very Victorian book. Um, and he takes on the fact that Liverpool was a very racially ambiguous place. There are still many people there whose families have been there for hundreds of years. And this was not an unusual thing. But I guess the question is, why would they use this ambiguity? What literary purpose does it, does it serve? Um, you know, and I think about the characters I've run across in, oh, um, Wilkie Collins or, um, the term that is so often used in Britain, which is people of color, which meant black for the most part, but then it got kind of more diffused and, um, and it's now come back into vogue again in Britain. Um, it didn't used to be used a lot. Um, they also make big distinctions between black and mixed race, which we in America tend 
to put into the same categories. I, I think Jennifer already said she identifies as black and I do as well, but we all also have these other kind of parts of ourselves that, so I think it's, it can be politicized, but I think in the Victorian period, I think it was to have an air of mystery, something not quite right, something um, not, as we would have said, kind of additional, but of something lacking. Um, there were people, there were numerous characters in Thackeray who are racially ambiguous, and it's not a positive thing. I think today it might be considered a choice, but I think at that time it is meant to be mysterious. I don't know. Jennifer, what do you think? Yeah, I would just, you know, I, I completely agree. And I was thinking about Kim Hall's work on yeah. the word fair, yeah. uh, which, you know, is not just um, about physiognomy, if you will, but also the moral category and the fair and the dark um, right. that get, uh, you know, those terms in terms of like the OED or whatever, I mean, have a very long history. And I think that that's, carries through in some of the way those characters are described, at least in terms of literature. And Kim's work um, goes back to the 16th century. So, I mean, we're not, we're not just talking about Victorians. It's not a new idea to them. This is something of long literary standing. Yeah. So I think we'll just do one more question. Um, and um, this is getting, uh, this is Miriam Wallace's question. It's getting a little bit about kind of institutions um, and thinking about um, um, institutional structures. So she, she asked, how might we think about institutional structures like departments and book series that create space and give voice, but then may limit seeing the intersections and interventions that black writers make? Um, what's lost in kind of framing um, institutionally kind of African-American literature or something like women and gender studies as, as categories, what work does that do, but also what might that shut down um, institutionally? Mm -hmm. Well, both of us have been involved in all of those departments and programs and, and led them, I think, both of us as, as well. Um, yeah, I, you know, I think academia, it, it has to be capacious enough to not put these categories into discrete places and to see the fluidity amongst them. I think more of that is happening now. But the idea that students had to pick a major and that major had to be very narrow and had to be very focused. When I first started out, I was told that I had to stay in one lane in terms of my own research. I mean, you wouldn't get tenure if you wrote a book that was not in your field. So I started off with Bloomsbury and I ended up with black British stuff and then I did African American and all of those were fine. I, I don't know that it works as well now. I think they really do want to see people more easily categor categorizable. Um, but you're, a, you're an institute head, uh, you know, I mean, how does that work? You have some fluidity in the people who come into your institute. They come from all different fields. Yes, this is why I love being director of the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity and it's Native American and we work closely with AAAS and Asian American and, you know, various groups, Latinx. Um, but it's an anomaly at Stanford, really. We are very departmentalized uh, and siloed in a way uh, compared to some of the other schools I've taught at. So I think it's also cultural um, and maybe it's not for everyone, but I was trained, I mean, in interdisciplinarity, in Victorian studies. We did art, political science, economics, history, literature. Um, I was always interested in everything. And so the bond there was the sort of at that time, temporal frame of Victoria's life, you know, 1937 right. to 1901. Right. But, but um, again, I think like you, I'm not the kind of scholar that um, works in a sort of tighter frame. And, and um, you know, I think there are all kinds of projects and temperaments and ways of doing things. Um, but I, I wish also that we could have a space that didn't sort of prescribe um, yeah. uh, a limit in that way. Yeah. Great. I think that's a great way to end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so too. And so um, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, Jennifer oh. and Gretchen. Uh, we really appreciate um, everything that you shared and the time and energy that you, you put into this.
Um, for all those who are, are listening um, and watching, there is more to come this week. Uh, we have sessions uh, throughout this week that you can still register for, and hopefully uh, you will. Um, and then also I just want to encourage folks um, that um, this is this is free and open and we're glad to have made it as such, but if uh, you could um, consider supporting the Friends of the Dickens Project and, and uh, financially supporting the Dickens Project if you're able, um, that would be a really wonderful uh, thing to be able to continue the work that it does um, in, in staging the Dickens universe and, and these conversations and, and all the work that it, that it does uh, throughout the year. So thank you very much for, again, and um, applause. <laughs> this is one of the awkwardnesses. <laughs> I know. Thank I you. just wish we were in the same room. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> yeah. th thank you so much. Thank you, okay. everyone, for, for attending. Bye -bye. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you.